Good evening, and welcome to Wednesday evening worship with St. John Lutheran Church in Ely, Iowa. I'm Pastor Brian Middleswarth. It is good to have you with us this evening. We have a small group uh, inside with us tonight. So I will talk to you who are watching a little bit about the process for folks inside so you'll understand what's going on. Uh, to care for each other, we ask that those who are present here, except for me, not speak, but it doesn't mean that they can't participate, it's just that they'll do so through gesture. So, when I invite to prayer, normally I will say, the Lord be with you. Your spoken response is, and also with you. For those who are present, the invitation is to return the gesture that I make. So it will go, the Lord be with you. You guys got this. Amen is the way we close our prayer. Uh, here, for those who are present, the amen is jazz hands. And if you want to make it loud, you've got to get your hands up higher. And finally, uh, during the uh, responsive reading at the end of our worship time together, we will each respond, the sun rises and the sun sets. Those who are here will actually kind of pantomime that. So it's arms one on top of another, and you make the sun, and it is the sun rises and the sun sets. Excellent. And on this Veterans Day, it is good that we are gathered together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, voices to proclaim you. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate in your glory and worship you in spirit and truth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our reading is from the Gospel of Matthew. It is the parable that follows immediately after last week's parable of the ten bridesmaids. Jesus said to the disciples, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. The one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done. Good and trustworthy slave, you have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. 
You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is another text that you look at as a preacher and say, what does one do with this? There are particular ways that most look at this text, and I'll get into those in a moment, but I want to start with an alternative understanding or reading of this text. We tend to, in these parables, look at them and read them with the understanding that this is some description of God or the way the kingdom of heaven works. But you'll note that nowhere in this text does it say that. So, at least some commentators understand that what is happening here is actually a critique of the economic system, at least partially this is what is happening, is a critique of the economic system of the day. The slave owner who gives the talent to his slaves and expects a return and gets a return of 100%, right? There is no legal way to do that, right? Somebody is cooking the books here, or at the very least, somebody is engaged in some illegal activity that makes that possible. And one thought is that the guy with one talent is speaking the truth about the slave owner. That... The slave owner has received this ill-gotten gains. And so one commentator writes this, this parable needs reassessing. It's not a prescriptive parable of how we all need to use our time, talent, and treasure well, as utilitarian as that interpretation may be. This story is a descriptive parable of how the system works when absentee landlords give money to servants only to demand back a healthy return. It is a descriptive parable of someone who refused to participate in that process. In a situation where absentee landowners and their lackeys were the primary interface between Jewish peasantry and the Roman Empire, that servant deemed lazy and unfaithful by the empire, pays an awful price for refusing to play along. A grim interpretation, perhaps, but no more grim than the words at the beginning of this corpus in Matthew 24, then they will hand you over to be tortured and will put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name." This author and others read this as a critique of the system that exists and understands the one to actually be acting in the stead of a faithful Christian, refusing to play along. Now I'm going to move back into some of the uh, more prominent understandings. And here's the thing, based on what we know, you can read it either way. It's one of those texts that is ambiguous enough to provide an opening for each to be a valid understanding. One commentator suggested you might start a sermon on this 
with the question, what would you do if someone gave you $1 million? Now, talent in that day and age is actually a unit of measurement, of weight. It is associated in this with money. Now, we don't know exactly how much would be in today's dollars, but based on some pretty common figuring, you could figure a talent was roughly worth $1 million. It is an extraordinary and in many ways an unbelievable sum, right? That you would leave a slave with $10 million, with $5 million, with $1 million. What would you do? with a million dollars. Now, the one given ten and the one given five go off immediately at once and traded. Um, the language here um, suggests that there is risk and reward in this. Um, it is something to the effect of that you exchange for something better. And they made, they, ga they gained that, but they risked what they had. And the last one, again, assumes, as one commentator puts it, that he or she was part of a zero-sum game and played it safe. He buried his silver. That's the term that's used there for money. He buried the silver, the best security against theft, right? In that day and age, go bury it in the ground somewhere. The master acts generously, right? The servants are given extraordinary gifts to be stewards of, but the slave sees the master as a petty tyrant. He understands the master to do things that the commentators point out this is not how God acts, right? God does not reap where God did not sow or gather where God did not scatter. In fact, God has, you know, if you look at the other images in this text, it, you know, the description is contrary to how God acts. So one question here is, what is our understanding of God? And are we using our talents in a way that corresponds with the truth of who God is or with a misunderstanding, a false understanding? who God is. One way of looking at this text in general, in that sense of a generous master, is the question of what do you do with the gifts that you are given while the master is away? This is looking at this text as the second in a trio, and in connection with the previous one, right? With the ten bridesmaids, which was about the waiting and being ready. This one talks again about what do you do with what the master has left you while the master is gone. Martin Luther noted that a tree is either growing or dying. And he said this is true of our spiritual lives as well. Luther said the Christian life is semper in motu, always in motion. Bernard of Clairvaux noticed that people who did not progress in spiritual life tend to regress. There's little that is in stasis in our lives, right? You're either growing or you're regressing. To quote one of my favorite movies, 
um, the Shawshank Redemption, either get busy living or get busy dying. There's a sense that perhaps we look at these talents as spiritual gifts or the spiritual life that we have been given in abundance. And the question becomes, are you growing spiritually? And if so, what is the fruit of that? Caroline Lewis, who is a professor at Luther Seminary, wrote this. It is really rather simple. What are you doing with what you have been given? The rub of the parable, of course, is to determine what you have been given. And moreover, to determine if whether or not the exercising of your gifts is for the sake of your own gain or for the sake of the nearing of the kingdom of heaven. As I was thinking about this, a number of thoughts crossed my mind Do we really know what we know? What is our understanding of God and who God is? Is God the petty tyrant who, if you don't do things well, will punish? Is God one who gives lavishly and who has said, as we give and share, abundance will return? That abundance shared creates more abundance. Abundance risked creates more abundance. Is this a story of the parable of the sower, right? That yields 30, 60, 100 fold. So does the servant with the one talent have a fundamental misunderstanding of God and thus doesn't do what is required, which is to risk the gift, the talents, to use the gift, the talents that are given unto him. And thinking about this text in terms of the waiting for Jesus to come again, which is, this, this is all within that realm the waiting for the end times. When Jesus comes again, time will end and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And there are times, particularly this year, when I have said, and oh Lord Jesus, may that be right soon. But remember the warning that in all of the Gospels, when Jesus talks about this in-between time, there are warnings about falsehoods and false messiahs, all of which masquerade as truth. I got to thinking about that a little bit. What is the truth? Jesus says, I am the truth. And I wonder at times if we have grasped on to other truths, other saviors even. Jesus is Lord. Jesus saves. Joe Biden doesn't. Donald Trump doesn't. If you think they are your saviors, you worship false gods and that's blasphemy. If you think a political party will save you, You worship a false god, and that's blasphemy. What saves? Christ alone. Faith alone. Truth resides in Jesus alone. There are things in this world that will try and tell us they are the truth that will paint a picture of who God is that will guide how we live. And if that is not the way God is, 
we will not use the gifts God has given us wisely. How do we live with what God has given us? And do we live in fear of the punishment? See, here's the interesting thing. The one who was given ten talents, the one who was given five, what if they had lost everything? All he says, we, we, there are some implications here, but if you look, all he says is you were trustworthy in a few things. He never says because you have doubled what you've been given. Right? We infer it that the reason they are getting rewarded is because they doubled. But what if they came back and said, I risked everything, I traded everything, I went out and, and spread that stuff everywhere and came back and I, I lost it all? Would the response still be the same? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. And what is the last thing that is always said? Enter into the joy of your master. One commentator writes, the master already possessing the gifts of the talents is inviting his servants to share in his joy. When the first two are finally invited to enter into the joy of their master, they are perhaps not entering a greater fullness than before, but rather now are able to recognize the dynamics of joy that undergird the gift of faith. They get it. They see it. Why? Because they have lived what it means to be faithful, which is to live in orientation to the world in the same way God does. What did God do with them? God gave them an abundance. What did they go? They went and spread that abundance into the world. They risked giving the abundance away. And what did they get in return? And it's not that that is the joy, but it is in that relationship and orientation to the world. The joy of the master is the joy of the feast that is self-giving, sharing, being distributed into the world. And in this sense, the interest gained on the talents is like the hundredfold that the disciple receives when he or she gives everything away to follow Jesus, right? Right? And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life, Matthew 19. The obedience of trust is not a burden or a fearful endeavor, but is precisely the joy of discipleship in which everything is given, the gift and the interest. And likewise, the journey of the master in the parable is no casual excursion. It represents a momentous occasion, a time for vigilance and stamina, a time when truth and falsehood must be shown to be what they are. We can deduce from the wider context of the middle of Matthew 24 through this chapter 25 over and over Jesus emphasizes that faithful Christian discipleship expresses itself through active and ready engagement. Matthew, over and over in the Gospel of Matthew, faith is active. It is done. It's not spoken. It is lived. In other words... This is an opportunity, a calling to live our faith. And in so doing, we enter into the joy of the Master. We experience, in part, the joy of the Master. 
as we give of the abundance that we have been blessed with, of ourselves. This is where the English word talent comes from. It comes from this parable. All those things that we have that make us who we are. And so I would ask us to ponder, what would we do if you were given a million dollars to manage? Do we risk it? What kind of God do we have? What kind of Jesus do we follow? How are we called? Do we risk? Do we fear losing it all? Or do we trust that even if we lose it all, we have gained everything? It is of no consequence. Why? I have a hundredfold. God will provide daily bread. Christ has already saved me. I have a family. Do we live this way? I invite you to ponder that with me and then perhaps to come back and join us on Sunday and you can see where my mind went the rest of this week uh, and how the Spirit might have worked in this moment and beyond. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, on this Veterans Day we give you thanks for all those who have served our country in the armed forces. We give thanks for those who have been willing to sacrifice for the safety and welfare of others. We give thanks for the families that serve with them. We pray for all those who have been touched by the violence of war and returned home. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, surround them. May your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, come to those who mourn loved ones killed in battle. And may your Spirit inspire us to be worthy of the sacrifice and service of those who have served this nation. We pray also this night for all those in the healthcare field who care for so many now who are sick with COVID. Their service the service of their families is also one that saves and inspires. Keep them well. Give them strength. And may their sacrifice and their work inspire us to do work of our own, to care for each other, to wear a mask for our sake and our neighbors, to keep our distance even as difficult as that is in this holiday season, to wash our hands, to stay apart so that this wave of virus might settle.
give thanks for the harvest that is almost completed, for another sign of the abundance that you provide us. And we pray. We pray that we might see you truly and that we might risk sharing the abundant gifts you have given us with others and in so doing experience the joy that you have in sharing those gifts with us. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join me in the responsive reading. The God of creation made the first day. The sun rises and the sun sets. Noah sat on the deck of the ark and watched a miracle. The sun rises and the sun sets. Joseph counted the days in his prison cell. The sun rises and the sun sets. David was inspired by the beauty of the sky. The sun rises and the sun sets. Mary prayed at sunset until morning when she could go to Jesus' tomb. The sun rises and the sun sets. We watch the days pass one by one. The sun rises and the sun sets. We enter into the night, the sun rises, the sun sets. God will keep us safe, the sun rises, the sun sets. God will give us rest, the sun rises, and the sun sets. God will give us peace of mind. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are with us. When we are at home and when we are away, when we lie down and when we rise, we are grateful for the gift of another day, for another chance to love you and love our neighbors. We are grateful for another day as your children, called, forgiven, loved. Give us rest now, Lord. Keep us and all whom we love safe through the night so that we might arise renewed to sing your praise at the dawn of a new day. Amen. And now, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join us for worship on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock a.m., Facebook Live. Until then, God's blessings.